So good morning again um, to those who maybe are visiting, maybe came in a little late. It's great to have you with us as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord this day, all those years ago. And if you have your Bibles, if you would want to grab them and go over to our gospel reading in Luke this morning. And uh, hearing Monica read that, it, there's a story I read of a little while ago where there was this young man who was doing the scripture reading for the first time in his service, in the service, and the bishop was there, so he was a little nervous, and he read that portion of scripture, the first 12 verses, and he said, well, here ends the gospel, and the bishop behind him says, well, I certainly hope not. (laughs) But the young man, you see, was not totally wrong. Because when we come to chapter 24 of Luke's gospel, we're indeed at the end. This is the last chapter in this gospel account that Luke wrote for his friend to tell him all about what really happened there in Jerusalem all those years ago. Uh, People who write for a living tell us that one of the hardest parts of a story is the end. Because you have to tie up all of those loose threads that you've left hanging throughout the narrative. Think of the end of a mystery story. Is it very satisfying when all the clues don't all fit together and make this great story? Well, certainly not. Or maybe the end of a sprawling epic where there's storylines from the characters that weren't tied up as neatly. There's no satisfying conclusion. The end is always the most important. And in these first 12 verses of Luke's end to this gospel, we get the beginning of the end. But it's not the end we think it is. It's not the end that anyone expected. Last week, we recalled the first Palm Sunday and that the followers of Jesus expected his mission to end with a revolution, to retake Jerusalem and all of Israel from the hands of the Romans. And God's glory would return to the temple and he would rule over the world from Jerusalem. Well, then Jesus was betrayed by one of their own and taken by the authorities who put him through one mocking trial after another. Eventually, they convinced these Roman governors to crucify him as if he were a common thief or rebel. The one they thought would throw off Roman oppression was in turn killed on the very instrument that represented the cruelty of the empire, a cross. This was not the ending the disciples expected. So the day comes after the Passover Sabbath when they're again allowed to resume their normal activities. And these women, they come to dress the body of Jesus with spices to honor him. This was a practice that was done for those of high esteem in society. But when they got there, the story's taken another unexpected turn. The ending they did not expect has an ending that they were not expecting. He was gone. The door was open, but nobody was home. And the scripture says, while they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. And these men asked them a question. Why do you look for the living among the dead? Don't you remember what he told you? The son of man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. And at that moment, at that end of their story so far, all the pieces fit together. The proverbial light bulb comes on over their head, although in their day it would be probably a candle. Uh, the cobwebs, they finally clear and they can see how the whole story fits together. They could see that the ending they had not expected was not the end Exactly. It was the beginning. All of history has rushed toward this very moment. And every day going forward would look back to it. Because on that early morning, the day that was dawning was the first day of an entirely new world. A world that had been fundamentally changed. And it's with this realization that he is indeed the resurrection and the life. They return to the other disciples who seemed to think that they weren't exactly in their right mind. They, it says they dismissed it as an idle tale and did not believe them. They come back and Jesus is, re- Jesus is really alive. Okay, Mary, let's get you back to bed. But one of them couldn't get this out of his head. He had to know 
whether or not this was true. And it was Peter. The one who Satan desired to sift like wheat. The one whose faith the enemy wanted to destroy. The one who had fulfilled the words of Jesus and given up on him. He couldn't just dismiss this story the women told. Maybe it was guilt. Maybe it was hope. We don't know. But something made him run down to that tomb and poke his head in. It says he stooped down and he saw the linen clothes lying by themselves. And then he went home amazed at what had happened. Marveling at what had happened. Dumbstruck, awestruck, speechless. From what had happened. Because at that moment something shifted inside of Peter. Perhaps he too has realized that the end he did not expect wasn't what he thought it was. Perhaps in those moments looking at those grave clothes laying by themselves without a body nearby. He realized that the world as he knew it had been changed. Change is a theme we've been considering this Lent. We began this season by acknowledging that no matter who you ask. In whatever age group, whatever social class, whatever financial position or political affiliation, we all agree that we do not like the way our world is going. We do not like the direction our society is heading. And even though we may all disagree on what needs to change and how to change it, we all know that something has to change. We know something is wrong in this world, and we don't know how to fix it. Well, it may not surprise you to know that God has felt somewhat the same way throughout human history. He has looked down upon his world, originally created with perfect purpose and perfect order, And he's seen it ruined by sin, death, and pain. But unlike us, he knew how to fix it. And he moved in our history to do just that. He started by calling a unique people to himself to show the world what it would look like to live under the tender care of God, obeying his commands and following his ways. But they did not listen to his voice. They turned away from him to walk in the path of death. And he could have left them to their own devices, sure, and allowed all humanity to go their own way. But instead, he chose mercy and moved to bring a final, lasting change. He went down into death to break its power over his creation. He took on flesh and lived among us. He shared in our sorrows, engaged with our struggles, and forgave our sins In his last days, he gathered the darkness around him, all of the hatred and evil of mankind, the idolatry of our selfishness, the parts of us that love sin and hate the light of God's revealed path, the ways of death that live inside each and every one of us. And then he took it upon himself and carried it to a cross where he put it to death in his body once and for all. He went all the way down to the grave where he broke the back of death and in his rising again took ownership of all of earth and heaven because the world is no longer now held fast by sin and nature's night as the old hymn says but now he is the one who holds the keys of death and hell and no one can take them from his hand. Humankind does not have to live in bondage to the ways of this world because he has made a way of escape by not escaping himself, but surrendering himself to the darkness to break its power. The disciples expected him to defeat Rome, but he went farther than that. He defeated the world, the flesh, and the devil. All of those things that weigh down on us. All of the moral corruption, the anger, the bitterness, the confusion, the bigotry, the hatred, the lust, and the greed. He took all of those to the cross. And in his flesh, he buried them. To rise again in vindication before all that is seen and unseen. All that is within heaven and on earth. That the cosmos may know that he is who he said he is. King and Lord of all. How can we see a change in our divided and broken world? Only through the power of the risen Christ breaking into our world. 
The power of God that raised Jesus from the dead, the power that broke off the chains of sin and guilt is the same power available to anyone who believes in Jesus. Maybe you're not one of those. Maybe you've never truly believed in him before. You've heard this story, but to you it's been an idle tale that you did not believe. Well, can I ask you, are you tired of the direction your life is going? Do you feel powerless to change it? Do you feel trapped in those broken ways of doing things? He can set you free. No obstacle of sin or shame cannot be rolled away from you. There is no place it's so dark that his light cannot reach it. It was your sins that he put to death and buried on that day. And they cannot keep you locked in the same old patterns and broken ways of living. Christ can make you free. His heart is bent toward the downcast and the outcast. He can put away those wrongs in your past, and he can pour his Holy Spirit into you to heal the wounds on your soul if you turn to him today. So turn away from those old ways of doing things and believe in the one who calls you to pick up your cross and follow him. And how can we who do follow him see a change in our world? How can we be the change our world needs to see? Well, maybe we need to stop following the old way of looking at things. Maybe we need to shake off the dust like the disciples did. Maybe we need to take a page from Peter's book and look long and hard into the wonder of Christ's victory over the world. Perhaps we need to be amazed again by Jesus and what he did. Because if we really understand what happened that day, then what on earth could we not have the faith to do? If we can only begin to comprehend this truth, then we can, like the disciples, turn the world upside down. Jesus changed everything when he rose from the grave. He opened the door to a place where heaven and earth meet, a place where perfection and peace that is to come in the new creation is now available to those who still walk in the ruins of the old creation. He brought new life with new power, and he put it in you by the Holy Spirit. And he didn't do it through political movements. That's what the world will tell you. He didn't do it through social revolution or violence. That's what the world will tell you to do. He did it through sacrificial, unwavering love and gave us an ending that we never expected. Because there on that morning, at the end of the old creation, he began the new creation with his people. A creation that changes everything. And that is the hope of Easter. Amen. Amen. Please stand as we confess these.